guess I guess we'll go ahead. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Jonas Dere from KU Leuven uh, Kulak, speaking on simply transitive uh, neural affine actions of solvable Lie groups. Okay, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for inviting me for this talk. So when I was invited, uh, I was asked like a topic on group actions is greatly appreciated. And so I decided to talk about actions of groups on groups. So I hope that fits in what you wanted to hear. And um, well, let me maybe start with uh, telling that the, the new results that I will talk about are all joined with uh, Marcos Origlia, who is also listening to this talk and can probably correct me if I say anything stupid. And so what I will do, I will start by giving a bit of uh, motivation why this problem uh, is important and giving some uh, background. And then I will shortly dive into what is already known on this problem. And I will try to be very short there because it's not always very important for the rest of the talk. And then I will give two constructions that will be needed to discuss the main results on these simply transitive actions. And I will try to illustrate how these results can be used in low dimensions. So you get a feeling on how they uh, can be applied. Okay, but let me start with giving some um, uh, <clears throat> giving some uh, uh, motivation. Okay, so let me start by giving the definition of a homogeneous space, which I guess is familiar for all of you. So a homogeneous space is a manifold where you have some action of a Lie group, which is transitive. And so action just means that you have a map from the product satisfying some additional properties. And you want this map to be smooth. And transitive just means that from any point in your space, you can go to any other point in your space via this action. And usually you're not just interested in uh, in actions, in, in all actions, but you want to add some additional properties on your the maps, the the, the maps that in, are induced by an, a group element. For example, if your space is a Riemannian manifold, you might want these maps to be isometries, or maybe some other geometric information that you want to be preserved. And that will be the point that we we come to. And as I said already in this talk, we will always assume that the space on which we act, the homogeneous space, is itself a Lie group. And we will assume that the action is simple. So it means that uh, the stabilizers of any element are trivial. So it means that if an element fixes some element of your, your space X, then it must be trivial. And so in particular, there's always a unique way to go from one point to another in your space. And in this setting, well, usually you're interested in the space X and you want to know how the action of G implies something about the space X, but we'll take a slightly different point of view in this talk. We will fix the space X and we will try to study what are the possibilities for the action of G on, the, on, the, on that fixed space X, like which G are possible and possibly in relation to what type of structure you want to preserve. Okay, this is all very vague at this moment. So let's make this a bit more exact by giving a classical example. You could take the easiest Lie group you can imagine, the abelian Lie group. You can equip it with Euclidean metric and you could wonder which Lie groups have a simply transitive action by isometries on Euclidean space. And okay, this is a very uh, classical result as well. Okay, yeah, maybe first a remark that since we have a simply transitive action, the space G and the space H are homeomorphic. And so, yeah, in particular, it's simply connected. And we don't really, I mean, we can just restrict our attention to studying the, the corresponding Lie algebra because our spaces are nice. And so we can wonder how the Lie algebra of G looks like. And then Milner showed in 76 already that it has a very specific form, namely, your Lie algebra has to be of the form, you have an abelian ideal, you have an abelian subalgebra, together they give you the whole Lie algebra and the action is by skew symmetric matrices. And so the, the, the Lie group G is, is very specific. It's two-step solvable, it's unimodular. So it's a very rigid structure you get there. And well, you could try to generalize this result by, for example, replacing the isometries by a slightly bigger group, like the affine transformations. And you can ask the similar question, what 
can you say about Lie groups that have a simply transitive action by affine transformations? And again, we can make uh, somehow a, a similar remark as before that we know something about the structure of G in any case, namely the affine group, it can be considered as a subgroup of GLRN plus one by yeah, the standard map that you probably know. So this group, this Lie group G is a, a linear Lie group and so since it is homeomorphic to Rn, it must be solvable. This is a classical result in, in Lie groups that, um, I mean, there's, you already know that your Lie group must be, be solvable. And so from now on, we will just work with Lie groups that are both solvable and simply connected because that's imposed by the question we, we ask ourselves. And so, a first step in studying this problem was again made by Milnor who showed if you remove the transitive assumption, so you only want simple actions, then every solvable Lie group can occur. So there's no condition anymore on the Lie groups that can occur if it's not transitive. And so a follow-up question that he asked himself was, uh, does it, could you, I mean, this result, the proof really, it, it's, gives you an action that is nowhere close to being transitive. But there were like no examples that did not have a simply transitive action. And so there was a question, maybe every solvable Lie group has an action of this form on Rn. And the motivation was uh, because it, this problem is related to what is called a finely flat manifold. And I will not discuss too much about it. I will make a small remark uh, on the next slide about these. But let me maybe first mention that the answer is no. There exists solvable Lie groups that do not have an action like this, even no potent Lie groups that do not have an action like this. And the example, the first example was by Yves Benoit in 92. He gave an example in dimension 11. And then uh, Bourdain and Grunewald a few days later uh, gave a family of examples in dimension 10. And in fact, later Bourde showed that on dimension lower than 10 and in the nilpotent case still, that all uh, nilpotent Lie groups have an action like this. So the, the example in dimension 10 is really minimal. And the idea of, of these examples was that, um, if I go back to my previous slide, that the Lie group that they constructed did not have a, a faithful representation into GLRN plus one. So it was impossible for them to have a simply transitive action like uh, mentioned here on the slide. Okay, so to come back to these affine flat manifolds, just not because it's important for this talk, so it's a bit of a side remark, but I think it's important that people still remember this conjecture that I want to mention. So if you ask the similar question or you want to study the similar question for discrete groups, and so for discrete groups, of course, you do not have any more simply transitive, but then naturally this is translated to properly discontinuous and co-compact. Well, you could wonder which groups have such an action which is simply trans, uh, which is um, properly discontinuous and co-compact. And there's a famous conjecture by Auslander that such a group has to be uh, virtually solvable. Okay, so the corresponding question for Lie groups is of course, is already answered because we already mentioned that the group has to be solvable there. But for discrete groups, this problem is a lot harder. And then maybe I, it's good to mention that for the other direction, that the examples that I mentioned before also give an example of a discrete group that does not have an action on Rn. So again, even as the Auslander conjecture is true, you cannot find every, uh, well, virtually solvable, of course not, but also not every virtually polycyclic group. So they, they even find a nilpotent group that do not have an, uh, a fine action. And on the other hand, this condition of being co-compact is really needed in the Auslander conjecture because Margulis constructed a free group that acts properly discontinuous on R3 with a fine transformation. So, okay, not too important for the remainder of the talk, but I just, I like to mention this conjecture every now and then because it's still widely open. And well, I don't know if I will ever see the solution to it, but I would hope that I would ever see it. Okay. So let me still take one step back. So we already enlarged our group 
of affine transformations from of isometries to affine transformations. And we can try to even find a bigger class in the hope of finding all solvable Lie groups uh, with an action then. And uh, well, the idea is a bit that Rn is an abelian Lie group. And if you just replace abelian with the next best thing, namely nepotent Lie groups, for example, the Heisenberg group is the classical example then. Um, well, you can still make an affine group there. You can make affine transformations. You just do the same thing as for Rn. You take your group, which acts by left multiplication. You take the automorphisms, which also act on your space. And you get an action of the affine group on H. And so the follow-up question would be, which groups have a simply transitive action on H via a fine transformation. And then it was shown in 2000 by De Kempe that in this case, all solvable Lie groups appear. So every solvable Lie group has an action of this form on some nilpotent Lie group uh, H. And okay, we know that there exists some H that does the trick, but uh, there is not too much known about which groups you can have on which nilpotent Lie groups H. So suppose you fix the Heisenberg group. Uh, you, I mean, up to uh, before our work, it was not known which ones have a simply transitive action on the Heisenberg group. And so that's a bit the goal of the, the talk today is to give some more information about which pairs can occur where G is solvable, H is nilpotent, and G acts on H in this very nice way of simply transitive. And we call it nil affine because the, yeah, it's a nilpotent Lie group. And yeah, we call this then nil affine to em emphasize it's not just the affine transformation. Okay, I will try to give a bit of uh, an idea of what was known uh, before Marcos and I started working on this. So if there are two cases that were known. Uh, the first one is if we know something about uh, the Lie group H. And so uh, Kim showed in 86 that the existence of such an action is related to a certain type of product on your Lie algebra called complete and left symmetric. And I will write the definition here. Do not worry too much about this definition. I will not use it uh, on after this slide. But I just wanted to mention at least uh, once this, this definition. So you can relate this, the existence of such an action to a certain algebraic structure, uh, a product where the, yeah, the product satisfies that the, the commutator coming from this product is exactly your Lie bracket and some other condition which might look strange at first sight. And then complete is a, a condition on some map that has to be bijective. So it's the identity map plus right multiplication has to be bijective for every element in your group. Okay, so don't worry too much about this. We will not use it later on, but I do want to mention something about the proof. In fact, what was already known before was that such an action corresponds um, to having an, a flat torsion free affine connection on your Lie group G. And then, I mean, the definition of this product here is just the, the derivative that, that's, well, you, you apply this connection to X and Y. And so what you can see then, and then this definition becomes less mysterious, I guess, is that this first condition corresponds to the connection being torsion free. And the second hey, one Jonas? corresponds to- Jonas? Having, sorry? Jonas? Yes? May, may I ask you something? Yes. Uh, do you need G to be simply connected for this theorem? Um, yes. Yes. You all, I mean, G will always be simply connected uh, because of, of be, being homeomorphic to Rn in this case. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, by the, the fact that you go to the Lie algebra and you state the problem on the Lie algebra itself, of course, there are many, there could be many groups having the same Lie algebra. So of all these groups, you select the one that is simply connected and that's the one that has a simply transitive action. Okay. And then uh, the second condition then corresponds to the curve. I mean, that's what you see here. And let me see how it's written here. Yeah, this is the, the curvature tensor written a bit, I mean, if you put this on the other side, that's the curvature tensor 
uh, that appears there. So maybe that makes this definition less mysterious if you put it this way. But in any case, uh, it seems maybe a bit technical to introduce this, this product. But uh, in fact, it's very useful because once you have a product, you can do more algebraic things, you can study ideals. And in this way, it was possible to find all possibilities up to dimension four when H is uh, a billion. And in fact, this is also what Burde used to show that up to dimension nine, all nepotently algebras have this complete left symmetric product. Okay. so. That was one case that is known if H is a billion, then there's a second situation that was known whether when you start with the no potent Lie group. And um, so then uh, the theorem uses the induced map on the, the Lie algebras. And then you have a map going from G to, I mean, the Lie algebra of the affine group is just H semi-direct the derivations. You get the two components T and D and uh, you can determine with these maps exactly when the action is simply transitive. Namely, uh, T has to be a bijection. So it's a linear map and you want it to be an, uh, a bijection. And DX should be no potent for all X. And I will come back to this proof uh, in a bit, a bit later. Um, but so uh, remember this table, we'll use it later on this statement. And okay, I don't want to send too much about the proof here, but the, the point is of this dx being no potent is used because if if you have a dx that is not no potent, then uh, it means that the action will not be by unipotent elements, and somehow you can lead to being the action is not uh, simple. But okay, I will come back to this later. I, I do realize this proof is not very enlightening this way. And so what they could use this theorem to show that up to dimension five, all possibilities occur. So it's just a good, good to have a bit of an idea. And if H is a billion, everything is known up to dimension four. If G is no potent, everything is known up to dimension five. And the big open question that was remaining was, what if G is solvable, but not no potent? And what if H is no potent, but not a billion? And well, we see two problems that we could tackle uh, related to this, this question. Namely, well, the first thing we want to do is, so you have this action, you have the induced map on the Lie algebras. And the first thing you would like to do is check, given that morphism, you would like to check whether the, the, the action that corresponds to it, whether it is simply transitive. So that was our first goal. And the second goal was, suppose that you're only given G and H, you want to determine whether there is a map phi such that the corresponding action is simply transitive. And we will, I will present an answer to both questions um, uh, in the, the remaining uh, slides. Okay. And so before I can say anything about the results, uh, I want to give two constructions corresponding to solvable Lie algebras. And let me first fix some notation. So you start with the solvable Lie algebra and the nil radical, the maximal nilpotent ideal, you can describe it as the, all the elements where the adjoint map is nilpotent. And we know, I mean, it's an ideal. We know that we can find the short exact sequence in this way where T is a billion. I mean, this is all very well known for solvable Lie algebras. And then in the ideal case, this sequence is split. Uh, this this um, this short exact sequence. Uh, I mean, the the solvable Lie algebra is split, so it means that it's a semi-direct product. And I mean, those are probably the first Lie algebras you think about if you think about solvable Lie algebras. But of course, not every solvable Lie algebra is split, and um, we will show two ways of enlarging the Lie algebra G in order to make it split. And the two ways are on the one hand, the algebraic hull, and on the other hand, the semi-symbol splitting. And I will try to introduce both concepts and try to show how they are related and explain a bit what the relation is to the problem we had before, but okay. Let me first by start by describing these two uh, constructions. So the first is the, the algebraic hull. And before I can say anything about it, I should describe what an algebraic Lie algebra is. 
And well, in short, algebraic Lie algebras are the Lie algebras that correspond to linear algebraic groups. So first I should explain what the linear algebraic group is. And I will only introduce linear algebraic groups over the reals. And so what is it? It's a subgroup of GL and R where the subgroup is given by the zero set of a finite number of polynomials. And okay, maybe it's better that I just give a few examples and you know exactly what I mean. So most classical Lie groups are in fact linear algebraic groups. For example, GL and R itself, because you just give no polynomials. SLN R is the one where the determinant is one. So the determinant, you can express it as a polynomial in the coefficients uh, with real coefficients. And then, so that's a polynomial equation. The same with the orthogonal group. I mean, you write down the condition, you see that they are polynomials and these are um, algebraic groups and many other groups like upper triangular matrices, upper large triangular matrices with one on the diagonal. So they're all uh, algebraic groups. And so in fact, being an algebraic group is something stronger than being a Lie group because every algebraic group is a Lie group with a finite number of connected components. So it's a stronger property than just being a Lie group. And let me illustrate this with a few properties of algebraic groups. Um, the first one is that if you write an element in your algebraic group, so it's also an element of GLNR because in the definition, we fix an embedding in some GLNR. Then, well, this element can be written in the, as a product of a semi-simple and a unipotent part that commutes, so the multiplicative Jordan decomposition. And for algebraic groups, you must have that both elements, the both parts lie in your group itself. So, and I will give a few examples later on uh, of groups that are not algebraic and ones that are, and, and you will see how this property plays a role. So that's already something that not every Lie group has. Even more, these maps that go from G to the semi-simple and the unipotent part, they are group morphisms if your group that you start with is nilpotent. And even strong, well, it's a different property is that if G is solvable, you have this decomposition into unipotent elements that forms a normal subgroup of your group G. And then semi-simple elements, I mean, not all semi-simple, there's always an abelian subgroup of semi-simple elements so that you have the semi-direct product. And uh, well, we call this a, a maximal torus in our group G. So every group has a, a decomposition, every algebraic group has a decomposition like that. And okay, not every group is algebraic, but you can always find the smallest algebraic group that contains a givable, given solvable group. So and we call that one the algebraic closure. So even if your group is not algebraic, you can take the algebraic closure to find them. Okay, so, but, but maybe this is all not, um, uh, but before I give examples, I will first go to the Lie algebra, but I will give examples. So don't worry if it's still a bit mysterious what they are. And the corresponding Lie algebras, we call them algebraic as well. So it's a property of Lie algebras for being algebraic. And okay, Basically, all the properties that I mentioned here have an analog for Lie algebras, of course. And the first one is that if you write an element into its semi-simple and no potent part, so the additive Jordan decomposition, then both elements lie in your Lie algebra. Again, the same property, if it's no potent, then these maps are Lie algebra morphisms. And if it's solvable, then you have this decomposition into an ideal of no potent elements and an abelian subalgebra consisting of semi-simple elements. And again, there is a way of taking an algebraic closure of a Lie algebra. So basically the same thing as on the previous slide, but then for Lie algebras. But okay, enough definition and properties. Let me give a few examples. And maybe the first thing that you really should keep in mind with these algebraic Lie algebras is that they depend on how you embed G into GLNR. And let me illustrate this with a very easy example. Well, three examples, in fact that really show how this works. Well, you look at the real Lie algebra, the, the abelian Lie algebra of dimension one. Well, there are a few ways you can embed it. You can embed it in the natural way, just one dimensional into GL1R. And then your Lie algebra consists only of semi-simple elements. There's a second way you can do it. 
you can embed it as no potent elements. Then you need an extra dimension, but then you just put an X on the, the top right place. And that's the same Lie algebra, but as a algebraic Lie algebra, they are very different because this one consists of semi-simple elements, this one of no potent elements. But of course, as just as Lie algebras, they are isomorphic. And this somehow illustrates that this embedding is important. And there's even a third way you can do it. You can combine both. You can put all, I mean, an X above the diagonal and X on the diagonal. And then you get an element of um, a three-dimensional matrix. And in fact, this one is not algebraic for the very simple reason that, I mean, this element you can, um, it has a no potent part, it has a semi-simple part and you can decompose it. And so this dimension will increase to two. Okay, so, just to emphasize this, this embedding that it plays a role. Okay, a second thing that could go wrong for not being, uh, well, a thing that could go wrong for not being an algebraic Lie algebra is what I said, that it does not contain its no potent and semi-simple parts. And so let me do is with the two-dimensional solvable non-abelian Lie algebra, you can embed it into GL, well, 3R here, I wrote N. Um, and you can decompose every element. You see that if X is non-zero, then this is the nilpotent part. This is the semi-simple part. And so both of them have to lie in your Lie algebra. And so take, if it's in the algebraic closure. And so if you take the algebraic closure, it should contain these elements, these elements. So it should contain these elements. And in fact, you can show that this one is algebraic. So this is the algebraic uh, closure. Okay, if X is zero, then, I mean, you have zero, zero, and a Y here, then this element is just uh, equal. I mean, it's an potent element then. Okay, I will use this example later on, so, but I will recall it then. That's why I want to introduce it here. But so that's one thing that can happen. If you take the algebraic closer, you can get extra elements because of the semi-simple and potent parts. Okay, there's a second thing that can happen if you take algebraic closures. It's, uh, and I, I, again, I illustrate it with an example. So you take this Lie algebra into GL3R. So as a Lie algebra, it's isomorphic to this one, but we take this uh, embedding. And so what happens now, if A, if alpha is a rational number, then this one is algebraic. Uh, and okay, uh, I'm not proving this, but maybe the easiest to see is if alpha is an integer, then in the corresponding Lie group, then this is saying, uh, well, that's this is n times this element. And so you can express it as a, a, a polynomial because it means that this one to the power n is equal to this one. And so that's like a, a polynomial. But from the moment that this is no longer a rational number, then this relation in the group will not be a polynomial. It will use an exponential. And so then uh, this, this algebraic, well, hull, I mean closure here, uh, but it will also be the algebraic hull, but I have not introduced that yet. Then this one, um, wait, uh, this is, I made a mistake here. I mean, this R should not be, be there, but the point is that uh, this D splits into two parts because you can never make this an algebraic relation and you get two dimensions and the semi-simple part, okay. Even if you didn't get this example entirely, and also because this R should not be there, um, know that there are ways to compute this algebraic closure, but know that things can get a bit ugly in this way, that somehow the semi-simple part can fall apart in many parts and, 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 okay, this is not always easy to compute, although you can do it. And then maybe a final example that we will use a lot from now on, if H is a nilpotent Lie group, then H has a, a structure of an algebraic group, of a unipotent algebraic group. Namely, well, you can always embed it as a subgroup of the unipotent group. And in this way, it will be a unipotent algebraic group. I'm not showing this exactly here, but know that this is true and it's unique, this way of doing it. And what does this imply? It implies that, so the affine group, which is the semi-direct product. So you have an algebraic group here, the automorphism group of H is also an algebraic group because 
it's actually the same as automorphisms of your Lie algebra. And you can check that the condition of being a Lie algebra automorphism is an algebraic condition. Well, so this group is a linear algebraic group where H is unipotent inside. And so in particular, the Lie algebra matching with it is also an algebraic Lie algebra. And this is the main example that we will use from now on. And it means that for subalgebras of this one, you can also define the algebraic closure because this one is already algebraic. You can define algebraic closures. And this is what we will use later on. And so if you have a simply transitive action, because we're still interested in simply transitive actions, then um, this, this algebraic closure has a very, uh, have a very interesting properties. It's what we call the algebraic hull of G. And okay, I, I gave the definition here. I will explain it a bit. So, but the theorem that states here that uh, this is really a very special algebraic closure of G. It has a unique properties uh, defining. So this, this algebraic hull is really unique of your Lie algebra. And what is what are the properties? Well, the first one is not uh, very special. It's just saying that it is the algebraic closure of G under this embedding. The second property says that uh, the nilpotent part is equal, has the same dimension as your whole Lie algebra, as does the Lie algebra G. So I will come back to an example to illustrate these last two properties. And the third one says that the centralizer of the nilpotent part is contained in the nilpotent part. Okay, let me go back to my abelian Lie algebra. What is this algebraic hull basically saying is that, well, this is not the algebraic hull of R for the very simple reason that, well, the nilpotent part here is trivial and it does not have the same dimension as uh, your original Lie algebra. The third one is also not the algebraic hull because we add here an extra element that is basically not doing anything. So the, the centralizer of the, the nil radical, I mean, this one will be inside and will not be in the nil radical or not in the, the algebra of, of nilpotent elements. So the second and the third condition basically are saying that this one is not a good one, this one is not a good one, but that G2 here is the algebraic hull of the abelian Lie algebra. Okay. Um, but maybe, I mean, I do realize that maybe this is a bit much if you first see this, but this is really the theorem that we will use uh, later on, namely that if you have a simply transitive action, then the algebraic hull is included in this affine, uh, in the, the Lie algebra of the affine group. Okay, but as I said, uh, computing the algebraic hull is sometimes a bit annoying. And that's why we introduce a second notion, namely the semi-simple splitting. And, and I realize it's again a definition and probably it's too much to really get all the, the details of this definition in the first go. But anyway, what it is, is basically saying is that it's a bigger Lie algebra, it contains G, that's what the third thing is saying, and it splits. So it's split into its nil radical and an abelian subalgebra, where this one acts by semi-simple derivations. So it's a nice type of, of Lie algebra. And then there are two technical conditions that are again somehow saying that this is the best one for doing this. And what you should really remember is that every solvable Lie algebra has a unique semi-simple splitting. So it's another way of embedding your solvable Lie algebra in something that is split. Okay. And well, we have two constructions now. Well, maybe give a few examples of the semi-simple splitting. If G is no potent, then the semi-simple splitting is just equal to itself. And you can check all the conditions. If T is zero, then that everything works. Okay. Maybe a second example that we will use later on is the following. Suppose you have a semi-direct product already. Um, then you would think, well, the semi-simple splitting is just equal to itself. Well, that's not the case. And I will illustrate what the semi-simple splitting is. Well, if D is not nilpotent, uh, well, that's what we assume because otherwise we're just in the first case. If it's not nilpotent, then we can decompose it into its semi-simple part and its nilpotent part. Note that this nilpotent part could be zero, that's okay. But in any way, we write it this way. 
Well, then, well, this should be an S. This should be DS as well. Uh, then the semi-simple splitting will be equal to almost the same thing, but you add one dimension. And you basically, what you do is you separate the nilpotent and the semi-simple part in the action. And then you can embed your Lie algebra into the bigger one by just doubling your T. And then you see that this is really an embedding. Okay, so this is the only thing that we will use but, later Jonas, on. So try, Jonas, yes, Jorge? This, this G prime you define here, I, I thought that R2 had to act on M by semi-simple elements. Uh-huh, yes, so that's true. And so that's why I picked M here and no longer N because yeah, I should have written this on the slide. The N of the definition before is the nil radical. And what you see now is that this first component of R acts nilpotently uh -huh. on M. Okay. And so this is included in the N. So I should have written here, this is equal to N semi-direct R. And the action of R is this. Uh, okay. Yeah, so okay, T yeah. T has dimension one here. Yes. T has dimension one. And the action is the semi the semi-simple yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. And it's trivial on the second, on the second R component. And this is what basically this last condition is saying that so the nil radical is a nil radical of your well that that's what this will be this is this m plus the centralizer of t and t i mean because this is r2 the, these two guys commute this is basically adding this extra component Perfect. okay Thanks. but yeah i do realize that uh this definition is maybe too long to really get in this, this short introduction in this talk, but I, I have to introduce it to state the main results. So that's a bit uh, the annoying thing. So, but what you should remember is that um, this semi-simple splitting is a lot easier to commute, uh, to compute. And so I, I've written here the, the way of constructing it, but I think I should really avoid going into these details. Um, but there is a way of really making explicit this, this uh, semi-simple splitting. You can really compute it given your Lie algebra. And in fact, in almost the same way, you can also construct the algebraic hull of G. And so what, what is really important for the rest of this talk is that the algebraic hull and the semi-simple splitting are strongly related in the sense that the semi-simple splitting is a part of the algebraic hull. And basically, the only difference is this um well this should be at s of g is that the, the 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 difference is that for getting the algebraic hole you really have to take the algebraic closure of t but nothing changes in this n so this n or how we write it here this this set of no potent elements this no radical of your semi-simple splitting that's the same for both of them and so we call it the nil shadow of your solvable lie algebra so it's a nil radical of the semi-simple splitting. It's also the nil radical of the algebraic hull. And the only difference between these two guys is basically the closure of the T part. So for what we will do, uh, that's a bit the, the, the takeaway from this slide is that although the algebraic hull is the most important one because it appears with semi-simple, a bit uh, the simply transitive actions, the semi-simple splitting is the one we will work with because it's easier to compute and the essential information is a bit the same. Okay, okay Jonas, but so. Jonas, yes? I thought that U of H sometimes is not the nil radical of H or. Well, it is for the algebraic hull. It is the nil radical what, of H. What if you have an, an element in T acting as zero? And yeah, so that's why I say, so it's the algebraic oh, hull, not just the okay. algebraic closure. In the algebraic hull, you avoid this with this, the third condition. So oh, there's okay. no trivial elements. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, I do realize that maybe all these definitions are a bit much and, and so you, it's easy to get confused. But yeah, it is the nil radical of both G prime and of the algebraic hull. Okay. Let me try to, because I only have 10 minutes left, to give an idea of the main results. And I want to end certainly with the applications, but because 
as technical as it may may seem, I want to illustrate how easy things are to compute once you get you know everything. Okay, so I will go a bit quick over this part and the proofs are in any case are very short. I only give an idea here. From now on, just to simplify notations, I will identify G with its image under the action. Because if it's not injective, then the action is not simple for sure. So this is an injective map and I can hope to, uh, well, you can, you can never hope for it to be simply transitive. So we will make this identification just to simplify notation. Okay. What we really know, what we really need to know is, um, well, if you have an action of G, you also have the action of the algebraic closure because it also lies in here. And what is crucial is that this torus part uh, will always fix an element in H. So this T, elements in this T can never uh, lead to a simple action. And uh, well, the proof is very simple of this lemma, but I, I, will, I will not mention anything about it. And so in particular, what it implies, and this is what was used before already, is that if G acts simply transitive, then this unipotent part must also act simply transitive. And the reason is, well, the transitivity is more or less clear. That's because this T will fix an element. And so if you want it to be transitive, it has to come from the first part. And the simpleness is, is because of, of some dimension argument. But okay, this was a crucial fact in the previous results that going from G to U of G bar is, I mean, simply transitive goes to simply transitive. Oh, I did not want to go to the very end. I wanted to go to the next slide. Sorry. Okay, that's what you hear. And what, what Marcos and I proved uh, was that the other way around also works at least if you assume that the dimensions are equal. And of course, this is a very mild assumption because if you want a simply transitive action, these dimensions have to be equal. So we do have to write it here, but know that in practice, this, this is like immediate. So we really have the converse of this statement. And um, I will not really go into the proof. It's, it uses the dimension a bit in, a, in an essential way, but um, it really helps to compute the or to show that a given action is simply transitive. Because what we can do now is suppose you have an action and you have the induced map on the Lie algebras. Um, well, what you have to do in order to see whether this action is simply transitive is you have to look at the nilpotent part of this Lie algebra because this one corresponds to the unipotent part of your algebraic closure. So you compute this algebraic closure and then you need that the dimension is equal, that will always appear. But again, this is in practice always the case. And what you need is that this unipotent part acts simply transitive. So you want um, that, well, this is applying the result that I mentioned before by Bourde de Kimpe and the Schamps. You want that this T map is a bijection and this is exactly the T map. So projecting on the H. And you also want that this D is nilpotent, but in our case, this is always the case because we assume that U of G consists of nilpotent elements. So it's something you can easily check. You just compute this U of G and then you take the projection and you see if it's a bijection or not to see if it's simply transitive. And- but, um, uh, yes, when, when you say bijection, uh, is, is an isomorphism? Yes, also it, it's- yeah, it's an isomorphism because they, okay. they have the same dimension. So it's it's a, an isomorphism of, I mean, okay. not of Lie algebras, but of vector spaces. Because ah, it's not, not a Lie algebra morphism because you have, I mean, it's a linear map, but I mean, you still have this action of the derivations on it. Yeah, 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 okay. So it, U of G and H do not have to be isomorphic. And I will give examples there uh, as Lie algebras, no. Okay, and there's a good way, but I, again, I look at the time and I should really skip this. There's a, I mean, this seems like, oh, you have to compute this guy and this seems very hard, but in fact, we give a way of doing this in practice uh, to do. But okay, the most important theorem is maybe giving G and H to see whether there is a simply transitive action. And we show that this is equivalent to the embedding of the semi-simple splitting into the affine transformations such that the n part embeds as no potent elements, the t part embeds as semi-simple elements. And again, this map, well, which is also noted as t, but it's a different t, 
the map that I mentioned before is a bijection. And the reason that this theorem works, I mean, and, and there's something extra in this theorem, if such an action exists, you can even assume that this T lies in the derivations of H. And the reason this works is exactly this relation between the semi-simple splitting and the algebraic hull. Because if you have a simply transitive action, you have the, algebra, the algebraic hull inside here. And so if you have the algebraic hull inside here, you also have the semi-simple splitting. That's what I try to explain a bit in these constructions. For the other direction, I mean, you embed the, the semi-simple splitting and you can show that the algebraic closure is the algebraic hull. So this proof, once you have all the things before, is not too hard. But okay, what I really want to come to, and I still have five minutes more or less to finish this, is to show how this works in practice. Because I've given many definitions and somehow sketched how the theorems work. But you want to see how this works in practice, I assume. So let's look at dimension three, which was not known before we started working on this. So I've listed here all solvable Lie algebras in dimension three. So you have the abelian one, you have H3, and then three other guys where two are families. And well, we want to focus on actions of non-nilpotent non ones. So the last three on non-abelian ones, so on the second one, basically, on the Heisenberg one. And what, what I will show, and I will uh, you will see once you have the results before, that this theorem is not hard at all. It sounds like a lot of computations, but in fact, it's not. That the only options are this one, this one with parameters plus or minus one, and this one with parameter zero. And how do we show this? Well, the first thing is always computing the semi-simple splitting. And I will go fast over this, but it's basically what I mentioned before that, I mean, it's a Lie algebra of a nice form. You split the derivation into a semi-simple and a nilpotent part. You split it up, you group it together so that you have the nil radical and the T parts. And the action of the T part on the nil radical is by eigenvalues 0, 1, 1. So the 1, 1 comes from this one. And then the, the part that you add here leads to an extra zero. And now, okay, and you can also do this for the other ones. And the other ones are even more simple because there you have an action by a semi-simple element already. And so, yeah, you just add an extra R here uh, in the nil radical and, and you get the, the semi-simple splitting. So this is something you can compute very easily. And the reason that I mentioned these eigenvalues is because they play a crucial role in what I will tell you next. So once you have the semi-simple splitting, you can try to embed it. And the first thing you want to embed is the, well, that's not given, but I tell you that this is the easiest way, is to try to embed the semi-simple part. And the a small lemma, which plays a crucial role in, in determining whether this is possible or not is the following. Well, you, you have actually two kinds of eigenvalue for T. On the one hand, T acts on N, on this nil radical of the semi-simple splitting. And on the other hand, T can be seen as a subset of the derivations of H. So we have two types of eigenvalues. On the one hand, eigenvalues for this adjoint representation on, on N. And on the other hand, eigenvalues in H. And it's very easy to show that these eigenvalues correspond. So in order to see whether you can embed these guys into the derivations of H, you can just look at the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues for the Heisenberg algebra, they come in a very specific form. You have two possibly complex eigenvalues and the third one is then the sum of the two. And that one has to be real. And in fact, this way, you can really show that the parameters that I mentioned before are the only possible ones because, uh -huh, let me go here, you need for the first one that, I mean, the sum of two of them should be the third one. So either zero plus one is one, that's parameter one, either zero plus lambda has to be one, then again, you get lambda equal to one, or either you have that one plus lambda is zero, and then you have parameter minus lambda. So that's the, the first one. And the same here. I mean, these are the two non-real ones. So the sum of them should be zero. And this is only possible is lambda is zero. So the condition on the eigen on the, the parameter here really follows from the eigenvalues already. So Jonas, once, 
Yes. Donna? So are you getting precisely those G such that G prime is equal to G? Uh, Any simple splitting is the same as the Lie algebra in this classification? No, no. Because I mean, I, I guess you mean whether the nil radical is equal to the H, that's what you mean? No. No, or no, that, that G prime is equal to G. G prime equal to G. That means that the Lie algebra is nil potent then. Uh, no, no, because... the same simple splitting is, is the same as the Lie algebra. Yes, I think that means that the Lie algebra is nil potent because if it's not nil potent, then the semi-simple splitting will be bigger. Um, but not if already you, you have semi-simple elements acting. Right? Yeah, but even then you see that, uh, whoop, where is it here? I mean, these Lie algebras were three-dimensional and the semi-simple splitting is four-dimensional. So from the moment that your Lie algebra is not nil potent, then the dimension uh, of your semi-simple splitting is bigger. Okay, but but you are getting precisely those where where the abelian part is acting in a semi-simple way already, right? Uh, no, because the this this one also acts on H three. I will. So this is also one of but the three options. Lambda is one or minus one. This is yeah, but this this third one here, this one acts not semi-simple, ah. but but it has a okay. semi-simple and potent part. Okay, okay, but they are like algebraic or something. Uh, yeah, but I don't think there's really something you can say about. Uh, their structure that easily, or at least not that I know of, I think. Um, okay, okay. No, I don't, yeah, I, I will give a list in dimension four and you'll see that many weird things can happen there. Okay, so once you've embedded the semi-simple part, what remains is to embed the nil shadow. And once you have the semi-simple parts, I, I, again, I don't explain this, but know that it's kind of easy to embed the, the, nil, the nil shadow. Okay, and for this first one, this is really trivial because the nil shadow is already H3 and you can just take the inclusion map. And this leads to the following theorem that if the nil shadow is equal to the, the group you want to act on, then you always have a simply transitive action. And in fact, this gives a new proof of, although I, I'm not saying this is new, but the way we do it here is new, uh, that every, solvable Lie group has at least one action on a nil potent Lie group, namely the one corresponding with its nil shadow. And the other two are more interesting and I give here the maps and okay, it seems like that you have to find these maps, but know that once you have the structure of the derivations of the eigenvalues, that it's very easy to find these maps. And uh, just to end uh, the talk, you can do the same in dimension four. Things get a lot more complicated, well, not more complicated, the computations are actually more or less similar, but of course there are a lot more possibilities. And I just list the potent ones here. And then on this slide, I mentioned the solvable ones and we, for each solvable one, we mention on which one of the two nil potent one it acts or if there are conditions on the parameters. And uh, okay, this seems like a lot of work and I'm not saying that it's done in five minutes, but know that really with the lemma that I mentioned before of the eigenvalues, it's, it helps a lot in determining these values. And that's what I've written here, that in each of the examples that we know of, once we embed the T in the derivations, there's also a way of embedding the whole uh, semi-simple splitting in this semi-direct product. And we do not know of any example where this is not the case. So somehow the strong restriction is really embedding the, the, the semi-simple part in the derivations and the other parts are follow more or less directly. Okay, I'm sorry I had to go a bit quickly in the end, but I hope that at least you learned something, albeit only about algebraic Lie algebras already. That would be nice that you know something more about them. And if there are any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Thank you very much for a really nice talk. Um, questions? 
Uh, yes, if nobody, <laughs> I can ask again. Uh, so from these two classifications, three and four, do you, I mean, can you guess some conjecture that is if and only if something, that, I don't know, a characterization? Uh, not immediately. It seems like, I mean, what ideally would happen is uh, that we would, could find the theorem, and I'm going back to the the very beginning, the result of Kim that relates the existence of an action to some algebraic thing on your Lie algebra, left symmetric product here. And, and that would be very interesting if we could link it to some, um, yeah, some, some extra algebraic information on the Lie algebra. I don't think that there will be something more that you can, I mean, yeah, it, 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 what we see from the examples that it's very complicated and, and it's not something that you can really like a, a feasible characterization in all dimensions is possible. Um, it's, it would just be nice to link it to some existing uh, structure on Lie algebras and show that it's uh, equivalent. In fact, and I didn't mention this, for nilpotent ones, the theorem by Burde de Kemp and the Schamps, you can somehow translate it to a certain action. I'm um, also a certain product on your, your Lie algebra and, and fully describe it in this way. And that's interesting because then you can use other techniques than just from Lie algebras. You have some product and you can try to to find other other uh, relations on your Lie algebra. Um, other questions? I was wondering if you could, I kind of missed the definition of no shadow a little bit. I was wondering if you could Go yes. Uh, the, so the nil shadow, you can see it in two ways, and it's related to this uh, these two constructions. Uh, let me go. Yeah, it was here on the bottom, and maybe I went a bit too fast there. Oh, okay. But it's the nil radical of both the semi-simple splitting and of the algebraic hull, and they are the same. Oh, okay. So it's, um, yeah. yeah, it's so a nil. Oh, go ahead. It's, a, it's an impotent Lie algebra of the same dimension as G that somehow takes into account all the, so you have the action on G on itself by the adjoint representation. Oh, let me go back. And it somehow glues all the nilpotent parts together to see what is really the nilpotent part of your Lie algebra. And then the other parts, the T part is then all the semi-simple parts together. So somehow it, it incorporates all the nilpotent elements of the adjoint representation. Okay, that, yeah, that was my, actually gonna be my question. So if I look at all the nil potent part of add X for every X, does that form, that forms the nil shadow? Or... Uh, well, more, yeah, maybe you have to be careful there that something doesn't go wrong, but that that's the idea in any case that that works. So what is the nil shadow? It's the nil radical of your Lie algebra. And then somehow you add in the remaining part, all the nilpotent parts of this, what, what remains in the, in your Lie algebra. So it's, it, yeah, the name nil shadow comes from the fact that it's somehow the nilpotent shadow of your solvable Lie algebra. It somehow takes all the nilpotent mm -hmm. things that you can find in your your Lie algebra and glues them together in one Lie algebra. Great. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, any other questions? Well, if not, then uh, thank you again for a really nice talk. It's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I mentioned, the um, next talk is in two weeks. The time is a little bit non-canonical. It's at uh, noon um, uh, UTC time. It will be by uh, Joan Park um, on March 9th. So thank you. I'll stop the recording.